Hey, so welcome back. We've been talking about drag forces and differential equations in the context of drag forces. And so what I would like to do next is to talk through an actual FRQ from the 2013 AP Physics E Mechanics. This is FRQ number two. And by the way, I did get this information straight from AP Central's website, and I'm using their publicly released information here. So let's take a look at this problem. So it's talking about a box that's at rest and it's going to be moved by a force right here. Notice we do have a diagram that's basically this that's been given to us. Notice it's not a complete free body diagram, it's just kind of a diagram to get you an idea of what's happening here. And so we're ignoring friction, there's a forward force applied, and there's going to be a drag force. So that means the faster this thing gets, the more force it's going to have in the backwards direction. And so that's what we mean by a drag force. And what makes it a differential equation is that we're going to end up with a velocity function plus the derivative of that function, which would be acceleration with respect to time, in the same equation itself. And we'll have separation variables and use the strategies that we've been using so far in the two previous screencasts. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works in terms of the questions. Okay, so this was from 2013, so things can change when it comes to grading, but I do want to point out that this very first question just asks you to draw and label the forces that act on the box. And imagine that this dot represents the box here. Draw those forces. So please take a minute to go ahead and draw those forces. Okay, and so hopefully you've drawn them. Let me show you what they look like. So you've got your forward force, your drag force, or backwards resistive force. You have a force due to gravity. You could label that as F sub G or MG. Oftentimes you can just go ahead and go to this step and label it as MG. And you've got your normal force up here. Now what's crazy about this, I want to point this out. This is crazy, but in terms of points, those four forces will get you four points on this exam. Four out of 15 points just to do this. It's amazing. How many points they're going to give you for that so try when you're hunting for points try to do the beginning of problems oftentimes you can get easy points in the beginning of a problem like drawing a decent free body diagram in this case for instance all right and so part b asks us to write but not solve a differential equation that could be used to determine the speed of velocity of the box as a function of time t fair enough all right so remember the box is traveling and it's got a forward force and a backwards force. We're not so interested in what's going on in the y-axis now, so let's take a look at the x-axis. We're gonna use our sum of our forces strategy like we have in the past, so that means you write out Newton's second law. And so we're talking about this net force in the x-axis, and we say, all right, I know that's true because I know Newton's second law is true, and I also know that the net force, or the sum of the forces, is literally the sum of those forces. So let's go ahead and add up those forces that are in the x-axis. There's a forward force, Fa, and a backwards force we're calling Kv using the variables that they've given us. And what do you think your next step is going to be? If you've been following along, your next step is going to be to take these two right here and set them equal to each other, and you'll get this equation. And the last thing here that we need to do, the thing that'll make it a differential equation, like I said, we want to get like velocity and the derivative of velocity, which would be acceleration over here, in the same equation itself. So we're going to put A in terms of the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. And so we go ahead and do that, and we get two more easy points. So, so far, there are six easy points in this problem that you can pick up with no problem whatsoever. Easy. Let's continue. Okay, part C says to determine the magnitude of the terminal velocity of the box. So at some point, the forward force is exactly equal to the backwards force, right? That's what we mean by that. So another way of thinking about that is to say, well, our acceleration is going to be zero. At terminal velocity, our acceleration in the X is going to be zero. That doesn't mean it's stopped. That means it does not get any faster. So we continue with that. We go back and write the equation I've labeled as 1 our previous equation that we came up with, and I'm going to say, all right, well, what would happen if acceleration is equal to zero? Well, what that would mean is that this would be equal to zero. In fact, this whole term would be equal to zero because this will reduce to zero, and then m times zero is just zero. So that's what we have right here, and next, all we're doing is just isolating, and we isolate some more for our terminal velocity, 
I do want to point out that notice this is still one more point. So we're talking about, I believe, 7 out of 15 points so far. And just for some preliminary work. So please be encouraged. Uh, you can do this. This is not too tough for you to do. Let's continue. All right, and here is where the technical work comes into play. It says use the differential equation from part B to derive the equation for the speed of the box as a function of time. Assume that V equals zero at time equals zero. All right, so we start with that equation that we had worked out for one of our previous letters that we're working with. And one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to start to separate the DV and the DT. We can treat them, we can treat this DT for instance, just like a variable. We can treat this dv just like another variable. So I'm going to multiply the left side by dt as well as the right side. And then we end up with this equation over here, which I'm going to label as equation 2. And our next step that we're going to be working with is going to be some u substitution to get there. The reason for this is because we want to take the integral of both sides. And if we take the integral of both sides, we have a messy term in the denominator over here. So it's going to be a lot easier if we just go ahead and do a u substitution. So I'm going to let u equal to this denominator over here. And then what I want to do is take the derivative of that u with respect to velocity. And if I do that, this fa goes away and you end up with minus k. That's the derivative of the right side over here. So then we say, all right, that's all well and good. But ultimately, I'm not so interested in, like with du, I'm more interested in dv, like solving for dv and plugging that in. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to isolate for dv. So I do that over here. And that becomes something I can isolate into my equation number two over here. All right. So let's go ahead and continue. What I would like to do next is to go ahead and take this red circle over here and sub it in for dv because we've solved for what dv is. And then also sub in our u value over here and see what happens. Well, what happens is you end up with 1 over du times du over minus k is equal to 1 over m dt. Fair enough. We still want to put this into a form that can be easily integrated. And so we want to pull out this minus k business in the denominator over here. So let's go ahead and pull that out. So we've pulled that out on the left hand side. We're continuing to put this into a format that can be easily integrated. And that's what we're doing at the end of this screen. I'm labeling that equation as 3. And so what you can see here is we are now going to take the integral of both sides. So let's go ahead and start that process. So what we're going to get out of that is I do want to take the integral of 1 over u with respect to u. That's going to give me the absolute value of the natural log of u. And I am pulling out this minus 1 over k business. Notice I do not have lower or upper bounds yet in my u term work over here. I'm going to save that towards the end after I sub back in what u is equal to. Notice on the right hand side I can proceed. It's pretty easy here. We're dealing with this step to this step over here. I pull out the 1 over m. And so we end up with t over m minus 0 is what we're going to end up with. What I do want to do, though, before I move on, is get rid of this minus 1 over k business. Just kind of clean it up a little bit so we just have the absolute value of the natural log of u on the left-hand side. So I am pulling it out here, this minus 1 over k. I'm going to get rid of that next. And notice I've gone ahead and moved that minus 1 over k, moved that over here so that becomes a minus k up top. And the right-hand side is pretty solid at this point. Let's explain what's going on with the left hand side here. So I went ahead between this step and this step over here. I resubbed in what my u is equal to. So now I've got down below here the natural log of fa minus kv. Now notice that this step right here I'm putting in my upper and my lower bounds here and I am ready to continue with the integral. So let's go ahead and do that. So if I plug in v as my upper bound right here I end up with the natural log of fa minus kv. And for my lower bounds, this kV term disappears, so I'm left with just the natural log of fa. And we have this business on the right is going to remain the same for a while. I hope you can anticipate what I'm going to do at this point to kind of clean this up a little bit. Think about your rules for our natural log. I have gone over this previously. Hopefully you can anticipate what I'm going to do next with this. And here is the equation I've labeled as 4. And let's go ahead and see what we can do with this. 
what we can do is we can have this expression up here end up in the numerator and this expression over here end up in the denominator. We are simplifying the equation using rules for natural logs. And so we're well on our way to solving the problem. Let's remind ourselves at this point, the point is, the question was, and this would be easier if you had the question written out in front of you, but for space, I have not been able to do that. But let's remind ourselves of what the question is. The question is, come up with an equation for V, basically. Come up with an equation for V. So our following steps that we're going to do is just isolating and getting V by itself. Most of this you probably know. There is one quick thing that we do need to be reminded of that's a little bit tricky, and that is really we want to get rid of this natural log symbol because we want V by itself. We don't want the natural log of V. So we want to get rid of that natural log to do that. Think to yourself, what would you do? What would you do to get rid of this natural log symbol? You're going to use the E function on both sides. So E to the natural log, they essentially cancel each other out. And so what you're left with is this. So you're left with FA minus KV over FA is equal to E to the minus KT over M. And so again, we're trying to isolate for this. So now it's just simple algebra to get this by itself. I'm going to move the FA over and then I will label that as equation five. Next up, we're going to drag the FA over and have the KV by itself. So minus KV, I should say by itself. So I want to get V by itself. I've got a minus and then I'm going to go ahead and simplify the equation even more. So V is equal to FA minus FA to the E over here over K. And that over here is going to be our answer. So our answer is not one number. It is a function that you plug stuff in. Like what's the velocity at a certain time? Well, we need to know some things about that. And if we plug in those knowns, then we can get an answer for that. And so that's what we've come up with right here. So that's going to be our answer. We got five points for that. And I want to point that out. You would have to earn those five points. Now with practice, this can become pretty straightforward for you. But if this was tough, just be reminded of the fact that you're in a race for time to try to pick up points. And we got four points just for drawing the free body diagram. We got five points for writing a differential equation. Obviously, drawing a good free body diagram is well worth your time to do, even if you're short on time. If you get to this point, if you if you get lost up here, somewhere up here, and you have a choice between getting lost in the weeds or moving on and getting some points on easier problems, I would say move on. But still, this can all be doable. You can practice this enough so that this becomes somewhat second nature for you. All right, and so the last part to this, it says on the axis below, sketch a graph of the speed of the box as a function of time. I want you to anticipate what this is going to be. Remember, you've got something that starts from rest. It's got a forward force on it, and the drag force is going to be holding it back. It'll reach some terminal velocity. That's a description of what we have. Now, based on that, try to envision what the velocity time graph is going to look like hopefully you were able to come up with something like this and so what happens is you approach a asymptote over here the value for this velocity is going to be fa over k that's what we solved for for the terminal velocity previously and so i'm going to go ahead and label that because they encouraged us to do to do that in the direction so if you take a look at our points down here they give one point for a graph that begins in origin non-negative slope everywhere concave down Secondly, for a graph with a horizontal asymptote right here. Third, for the correct label, the expression for the asymptote or maximum on the vertical axis. So even if you got that previous problem wrong in terms of figuring out what the terminal velocity was going to be, you could still put that incorrect one here and still get a point. In other words, a major concept I want you to know about grading for the AP is that they will not double ding you. So if you miss that point earlier, where it said, hey, solve for the terminal velocity, you got that wrong. And if you still put that wrong answer right here, you could now get this point. They will not double ding you if you know my terminal velocity should be at this point, so I should be able to label this with my terminal velocity. So hopefully this makes more sense now. Hopefully you're able to do problems on an FRQ level, on an AP Mechanics C FRQ level, and hopefully this increases your confidence as you're getting ready for the test. Thank you for listening.